Hey guys, today I'm going to show you this famous temple called Chennakesava Temple, but I'm only going to focus on these statues on top, popularly known as Madanikas. Why were they put here? Were they put here simply for beauty or do they have a deeper meaning? These are the questions we will decode in this video. At first sight, your natural inclination is to admire the beauty of a Madanika herself. Here's a carving that is simply impossible to ignore. She is beautiful in every aspect. Her facial features, her eyes, her eyebrows are amazing. And look at her hair, how everything looks perfect. She has a fashionable hair clip to make her hair twist and turn beautifully. At the end, her hair is perfectly cut into a straight line. Her body is just breathtakingly beautiful, adorned with a variety of ornaments. Here's another spectacularly beautiful woman. Her hairdo is quite different from the previous Madanika. She looks majestic and is lifting one of her feet and her assistant is doing something. What is happening here? She's actually holding a ring, a toe ring in her hand and her assistant is putting another toe ring on her toe. If you zoom in, you can see her individual toes and some of them already have rings. There are a total of 42 Madanikas in this temple. The word Madanika means to get you excited or aroused especially by beauty or love. And even after 900 years, visitors, both men and women, are completely captivated by the beauty of these Madanikas. Here's a woman with a strange facial expression. What is happening to her? She is singing. Look below, you can see a bunch of drummers on the left and a man playing a flute on the right side. So she is the lead singer. That's why her mouth is open, because she is singing. And not only do we see the upper row of teeth, the sculptor has even carved inside her mouth. This is just fantastic. Here's another woman who is also singing joyfully and playing the cymbals in her hand at the same time. It looks like she's blushing and smiling at the same time, as though it is her first performance. So our natural inclination is to admire the beauty of these Madanikas. If you manage to get past the beauty of these women, which is very hard to do, you will start observing other fascinating aspects based on your skill set and education. For example, if you're an engineer or an architect, you will notice how they have placed this at an inclined angle, and this angle is individually crafted for each location. So when you see this from the floor, it looks perfectly aligned with your line of vision. I mean, if these carvings were placed straight at 90 degrees, they will not be that appealing to you. But if you're an artist or a sculptor, you will see how artistic this filigree work is. Behind every Madanika, there is intricate filigree work. And even more interesting is that light can pass through these holes and you can see them shining through and hitting the wall in the back. If you're a sculptor, you will realize how romantic the ancient sculptors were. Here's a shawl, a part of her clothing, but look at the detail. It's designed like a seashell. It's carved inside hollow like a giant shell. This is extraordinary sculpting work. You don't need this kind of carving. The sculptor is basically just showing off that he can do it that he is able to carve stone into a hollow seashell with inches of hollow space inside. Again, he has carved some pattern inside for that magical effect of a flying piece of cloth. 
whether it's the flying skirt of Marilyn Monroe or the sari from a Bollywood movie, this is just an example that humans have not changed at all in the last thousand years. If you're a physicist, you will notice gravity, how all the ornaments are sliding down because of the gravitational pull. This temple is known for its connection to gravity and anti-gravity, and you can see it everywhere. Of course, if you're a fashion designer, you should definitely visit this temple and study the ancient fashion accessories. It's just insane. I would claim that it is equal to what we have today. Look at this model, how beautiful she is while she is standing. But more interestingly, see how they are showing the transparency of the dress here. This thin cloth is nearly see-through. It's covering her thigh, yet her skin is completely visible because the cloth is so diaphanous and you can see how the cloth is stretching at the back. She wants to lure you, but you will die if you touch her. That's why they have carved a scorpion here. Can you see the nails here? There's something strange about them. They're too long and this weird mark on her fingers, we normally don't have it, but this woman is actually using artificial nails. That's the only reason the sculptor has carved this detail. The artificial nail is placed so high that the skin is stressed because of it. And look at the multiple bells attached to her skirt. Some of them are in clusters, and some of them are attached individually. Now, quite interestingly, you can see the same bell pattern in Qutub Minar, which is considered India's first Islamic monument. But there's another level to this. Details that can stun anyone, regardless of your job or mindset. It's quite refreshing to see a male Madanika. This guy has a beard, and he's holding a drum. His right hand is broken, but it's clear that he was using his right hand or holding a stick to beat the drum. But look at that drum. There's a clear depression carved in that drum because this man has been beating it hard every day. That is an insane detail, and no, it's not a coincidence. Look on the other side. The drum has been hit so many times, so hard by this man. There is a permanent depression here too. And look how his left hand is inside the threads holding the drum. His fingers are carved between the drum and the ropes. But it's all an illusion because it's just made of stone. But they're showing you multiple levels of depth in such an insane fashion. Look at the ropes, which are not only carved exactly as how the ropes would be, but also the tension in the ropes when tied tightly. Even that's shown in this carving beautifully. And look at his hair bun. Every strand of hair is visible, and his beard and mustache, just so fashionable. On this Madanika too, every strand of hair is carved. You can see her sideburn with a bead stuck in it. You can even see how her hair is bending and is moving into various buns behind her head. I mean, this is a crazy level of detailing for a statue that's going to be placed 15 feet above the visitors. I'm only able to show you these individual strands of hair because I'm zooming in with my DSLR camera. Otherwise, you cannot even see this detail. This also debunks the traditional theory that Indian kings were able to build such fabulous temples because they used thousands of slaves and forced them to build these temples. There's no way you're going to get this kind of an output using brute force. The sculptors absolutely loved their jobs and wanted to be the best, and they wanted people to talk about their work even after a thousand years. 
And that's exactly what is happening now. Here's an ancient dancer. Look at how her knees are bent and she's about to keep her left leg down, but that leg has not touched the floor fully yet. This moment must have been imprinted in the mind of a sculptor. And it's extraordinary that he has decided to carve it. And in that moment, look at her foot. You can not only see underneath her foot and her big toe, you can also see her second toe with a toe ring on it. In other carvings too, you can see such details. The human feet is curvy, it's not perfectly flat. When we place our feet on the ground, there is usually a gap in certain areas and they've carved that detail. And many times we don't place all our toes firmly on the ground. This is also carved. This level of detailing is just unheard of. This is why the Chenna case of a temple is legendary and gets millions of visitors every year. Here's a woman tweaking her hair in front of the mirror. But the mirror even has a handle at the back and look at her thumb and her fingers, how they're used to hold the handle. These are insane details. Here's another girl in front of a mirror. But if we zoom in on the tiny woman at the bottom, we can see a hole at the belly button, the navel. It's a hole drilled into the stone to mimic the belly button. And look at the bigger Madanika's anklets. The sculptor has actually drilled tiny little holes all over the anklets, very similar to what you will find today in Indian anklets. These details are completely invisible to the naked eye. So it's all about details in these Madanika statues. But what is the point of details if there are no feelings and emotions? I mean, these are just stone cold statues, right? Here's what I found when I zoomed into this woman's face. This woman is crying not just a little bit of tears, it's pouring down. She's crying a river. Why would such a pretty woman cry like this? I think there are secrets, many secrets about human emotions hidden in these Madanikas. Some carvings clearly show aspects of fear and horror in them. Not only is she holding a scepter with a skull on top, even her crown is studded with skulls. But these Madanikas not only show explicit emotions like fears and tears, they also show very subtle feelings. Look at this Madanika, a very beautiful young girl, but when you observe her face, she is clearly depressed. Her face looks so dull, something is definitely bothering her. Her face looks so devoid of any happiness and even after 900 years, we can still feel empathetic because we can feel her sadness. But were Madanikas just all about emotions though? Because humans are rational creatures. I mean, this is the big difference between Homo sapiens and other species, right? We can get past irrational emotions and we can drill down to understand why something is happening. Why is she upset? Why would such a pretty girl who can also afford all the jewelry and possessions be so depressed? Let's examine her closer. There's a small round mark below her right breast. It even has a tiny little projection at the center. What could that be? Yes, she has a third nipple. In medical terminology, we call it a supernumerary nipple. This is a fascinating feature we can see in an ancient carving. Now we can understand what is bothering her. She's depressed 
because of her third nipple. And yes, there are two doctors carved below. One is giving her a potion to drink, perhaps an anesthetic or alcohol to numb the pain. And the other doctor is grinding some herbs for a medical procedure. They were probably going to surgically remove the third nipple because cosmetic surgeries were mentioned in ancient Indian texts like Sushruta Samhita. But you know what's really crazy about this carving? Guess how many people have a third nipple? Modern studies show that one in 40 people have a third nipple. There are exactly 40 female Madhanikas placed in this temple, and this is the only one with a third nipple. Is this just a coincidence? Or were ancient Indians taking statistics just like us? Is this why they carved the third nipple in one Madhanika out of 40? Now, there are writings underneath some of these statues and maybe these writings say something completely different. And this is where I'm being a conspiracy theorist because I feel like these writings are new additions, perhaps done in the last few centuries. They were not a part of the original design of the temple. Look at how advanced these carvings are and how basic these writings are. They're not written well, and they're not spaced properly. Even worse, in some Madhanikas, you can see there are no writings. So I don't think the ancient builders would do a half-baked job like this. It's only about 40 Madhanikas. If they wanted to write on these statues, they would have written on all of them. Why would they leave some of them blank? I think these writings were done by later people. Sorry about my rambling, but we have already discovered a third nipple, so it's possible that these Madhanikas are all about medical technology and medical conditions. Here's a woman holding something strange. Take a careful look. Does it remind you of anything? Yes, you have seen this at your dentist's office. It's a dental model of the lower jaw with 12 teeth. This is the same number of teeth human adolescents have. Look at the similarity of today's dental models. The similarity is insane. Is this why she's holding a dental instrument in the other hand? Even today, all dentists use an instrument called a dental elevator that has a broad base and a sharp end. Are we looking at an ancient dentist holding a dental model in one hand and a dental instrument in the other hand? More importantly, are Madhanikas actually telling us about medical technology and diseases? Now, let's go back to the crying woman. Tears are pouring down the cheek and no, she does not have a third nipple so why is she crying? Perhaps her hand signal could give us a clue. This is an ancient yogic practice. This hand gesture is called Suchi Mudra and is said to heal a variety of medical conditions. So what is she suffering from? If you look at the back of her head, you will realize that she's suffering from alopecia. If you've never heard of it, it's just a fancy medical term for hair loss. Just zoom into her hair bun and see, her real hair is paper thin at this point, and look at how beautifully they're showing how her thin real hair is attached to her hair extension. The huge bun at the back is completely artificial. Looking at how much hair she has left on her scalp, she will probably become completely bald in the next six months. Now we can understand why this woman is crying. Humans spend an insane amount of time thinking about what others think of them. You tend to be so conscious of the smallest defects in your body. Other animals don't care about this, right? 
In fact, we can find something crazy at the bottom of this crying woman. A monkey is laughing at her. Look at its face. Even more interesting, the monkey is also shown bald with no body hair. It seems like the monkey is laughing because it also does not have any hair, but it does not care. But it's laughing at the self-conscious woman. Wait a minute, the Madanikas are not about humans at all. This is all about animals and their behavior. And we can see these animals carved with their strange behavior everywhere. Here's a carving that's simply impossible to ignore. She's beautiful in every aspect. Her body is just breathtakingly beautiful. And of course, she's not only enchanting to humans, even animals want to see her body. Here's a monkey pulling her clothes. It has successfully removed her top and she's trying to shoo the monkey away with a tree branch and her assistant is laughing at the whole thing. This monkey carving is broken uh, and I thought it might be an alien at first, but then I found a similar Madanika in the same temple, clearly proving that this is a monkey. Here again, the monkey is pulling the clothes of this woman and look, the monkey has a naughty smile, a dirty desire to see the body of the woman. And of course, you may ask the question, do monkeys really do that to see a woman's private parts? Like they're a separate species from humans. Like we don't normally look at a naked monkey and get excited, right? But recent studies show that many animals can get excited by looking at human bodies, especially monkeys and apes. So these carvings are not just imagination. This animal behavior must have been studied by ancient builders and recorded in the form of carvings. Look how clearly the monkey is pulling the clothes of this woman and the woman is trying to use a stick to make it stop. By the way, Indians still live very closely with apes and monkeys because they consider them as gods. And these animals are not pets. They are visitors who can come and go as they please. Even today, monkeys are served food while sitting along with humans in many temples. So the Madanika statues seem to be more about animal behavior than humans. Here you can see this beautiful woman looking into the mirror. But look below, one of her assistants is holding a pet monkey, just like how we hold a baby. In the other hand, she's holding a bunch of grapes and you can see the monkey eating a single grape. The monkey looks visibly happy because monkeys love sugary fruits. But it's not just about monkeys, it's about other animals too. Here's a woman who harvests scorpion venom. Today, one gallon of scorpion venom is worth $39 million. But milking scorpions is not new technology. These women, known as Vishakanya, were doing this thousands of years ago in India. But ancient humans also understood birds and used them very effectively. Pigeons are well known for finding their location and were used for sending messages. This is called pigeon post. Think of this as an ancient email system, and this was used worldwide by ancient people. But ancient Indians did not like this system. A message tied to a pigeon can be quite obvious. So ancient Indians devised a voicemail system. Look at this girl's mouth. She's not talking, she's listening. Listening to what? the voicemail from a parrot. 
Look at the parrot's mouth. It's quite open. It's telling her the message. This is fantastic. In another carving, you can see who's sending the message. She's holding a bunch of palm leaves and she looks very serious. She's probably a government officer. If you look at the expression of both their assistants, it's quite clear that this is just official business. They look deadpan with no expression. But one good thing in ancient times, they did allow employees to wear shorts to work. So it must be a Saturday or something. But on a serious note, this was an ancient voicemail system. The woman will tell the parrot a message using her voice, not a physical piece of message. She will make sure that the parrot is able to repeat the message. And then the parrot will fly to the other person and repeat the message using its voice. Only if it delivers the voicemail successfully will it be given these treats. These are berries kept ready by her assistant to be given to the parrot. But look at this guy. I'm not sure about him. He seems to be having his hand near his ear like this, trying to overhear what the parrot is telling the woman. This is like Alexa or Siri spying on us, secretly listening to all our conversations. This is the ancient spying system. I have always wondered if parrots would survive miles and miles of traveling. Here's a bird, but when you see below, you can see a female hunter who has just released an arrow. You can see that there's no arrow in the bow, but look at her leg. She was aiming quite intently on killing the bird. Here, you can see her assistant holding a bunch of arrows ready to be used. The necklace swings in a very strange angle. You can see that the stone necklace is actually still attached here. It's done so cleverly that it's nearly impossible to see it. Here is this majestic female hunter holding a bow. The bow looks very fancy, but time has broken it. At the bottom, on the right side, we can see her assistant carrying another bow on her shoulder. And she has tied a deer on one side and a bird on the other side. They were killed during this hunting session and are being carried back home. On the other side, we can see another assistant who's also standing with a bow. And this assistant has her own assistant who's removing a thorn from her feet. So this woman is subordinate to this woman, who is in turn subordinate to this hunter. What the carvings are actually showing is the ancient social system. Imagine a hunter, even a professional hunter in the US, does he have one assistant helping him? And does that assistant have another assistant under him, unless he runs a large successful hunting organization, he may not have this kind of a hierarchy. Now, what do we hear from historians about ancient India? The classic theme is that hunters eating meat were untouchable, they were outcasts, they lived poorly and simply. But that's not what we see here. Now, Another interesting feature you may have noticed is that the entire team is made of women. There are no men in this hunting expedition. Many historians argue that ancient Indians were quite oppressive against women and kept them permanently indoors. Was ancient Hinduism partial between men and women? Yes, evidently it's very oppressive to men, out of 42 Madanikas, only two are male. All others are women, and they're shown not only as dancers or beauties, but they're shown riding, hunting, playing musical instruments, sending and receiving messages, and doing other activities. The key feature of these Madanikas is that 
they show the ancient social system, you know, how the society actually was. But wait, okay, it is true that maybe some women lived independently and they had their own hierarchies. But does this mean there was equality between men and women? This is all women. It doesn't show a man working under a woman, right? Here, you can see this woman, her mouth is open because she's a singer. She's singing, but look at her assistants. She has a lead drummer under her who has two of his own assistants and all three men work under her. So I don't think in ancient India, people cared if you're a woman or a man. They just cared about how well you did your job. But wait a minute, we are missing something really important. Are all these Madhanikas independent of each other or are they all connected to each other? These three drummers are carved large scale as another Madanika statue. The connection is very strange because look at this drummer. He's just a smaller figure in the statue, but you can still see his upward pointing mustache and a very well-trimmed beard. And one hand is inside the robes, which is shown in the shiny carving. And now look at the large scale Madanika the same details in large scale. Underneath him, you can see these two drummers. They seem to be clean shaven, no beard or mustache. And you can see they're holding barrel like drums in their bare hands. It's not identically carved, but it's carved to mimic reality, like comparing a picture of you today and a picture of you last year. There are some changes, but it's clear that these are the same people. On the other side is a flutist. What is strange is that the flutist is also carved as a large Madanika. Now, this is a very strange butterfly effect kind of a thing we have totally missed. All these Madanikas are intertwined into one story. The woman with the third nipple, who was highlighted just before her surgical procedure, is shown as a mere subordinate in another carving. She's just a tiny piece of the design working under a woman who's admiring her beauty. Look carefully, she has a third nipple under her right breast and she has a circular hairdo at the back. This is the exact same feature carved in the big Madhanika, third nipple under her right breast and circular hairdo. I can show you many examples about how every Madhanika is connected to another Madhanika, which is in turn connected to another one, forming an insane network. But there's a strange secret hiding in this temple that might reveal the actual purpose of these Madhanikas. Out of 42 Madhanikas, only 38 are placed outside. Four of them are placed inside the temple. Let's go take a look at what we can find inside. These four Madanikas are placed in one area and they look much more polished and ornate than the ones outside. But the archaeology department has revealed some shocking secrets about these Madanikas. Take a careful look at this woman. They say everything is made of one single stone. It looks like metal, but it's made out of soapstone. But the color of this particular bangle is totally different. Now, archaeologists confirm that this bangle is rotatable. You can rotate the bangle separately, and archaeologists confirm that this is also made of stone. The color of this bangle is distinctly different. It's clear that it's made of a separate stone. That is why it's rotating freely. But how did they put it through the hand and wrist of the statue? 
Look at the size of this bangle and the size of her palm. The bangle has a smaller circumference than her hand. Today, we see women put on bangles by squeezing their fingers and pushing the bangle through. But how can you squeeze the fingers made of stone? So how were these two different stones joined? On the other side is a spectacular dancer. She's performing a classical Indian dance called Bharatanatyam. And this dance form is still very much alive today. These dancers are known for their extraordinary moves and their brilliant facial expressions. On their forehead, they wear a pendant that jiggles ever so slightly with their dance moves. But archaeologists have revealed something shocking. The pendant on the forehead of this dancer can also jiggle. If you touch it, it'll move. Experts confirm that the pendant is not an attachment. This entire statue is made of one stone. So how did ancient builders create a movable stone pendant? Ancient stone technology is quite shocking and these two other Madanikas inside the temple also hold some mesmerizing secrets. It's clear that it's impossible to build an ancient civilization without advanced technology. So were Madanikas put here to make us rediscover ancient technology? Were they specifically put here to make us understand lost knowledge? But we missed something really crazy, something unimaginable. Here's a Madanika with her attendant, with her beautiful dance moves. But there's a very obscure little carving behind her. It's a very strange animal. And you can go into the details and be caught up in the details. It's a reptile. It can be a giant lizard. It can be a prehistoric dinosaur. And it's approaching another animal that's eating a jackfruit. But what really bothers me is the curves. The curves in this lizard and the curves in this woman are not similar. They're identical. This is not a coincidence. There is a hidden message there. So are they telling us that these Madanikas are reptilians? If they're comparing this Madanika with a reptile that's getting ready to catch and eat another animal, who is the animal the Madanika will prey on? There are deeper philosophies hidden in these statues. Is it possible that these philosophies are the actual purpose of the Madanikas? No, the whole idea of Madanika is to create Maya, an illusion, a smoke screen to distract you from the gods. Did you even see this face with a mysterious smile right behind this Madanika? The Madanikas are literally put in front of the gods to divert your attention. Yes, you're going to be really distracted when you see this woman crying like this. Even more disturbed when you see this monkey laughing at her. Then you may realize she has a hair extension and start connecting the dots and be caught up in human misery. But if you do manage to get past everything, there is a mysterious, simple male god with a strange smile on his face, quietly waiting at the background. The question is not why she is crying. The question is, can you get past her crying? That is the real question. Can you get past your empathy? your emotions, and look at God. Of course, it's your choice. You can stop with humans. You can even help her. But are you going to go beyond your feelings and thoughts? Behind every ornate, eye-catching Madanika, 
there is a simple statue waiting for you. Now, what is the meaning of the word Madhanika? It means to get you excited or aroused and make you feel primal. They're trying to distract you with your own thirst for beauty, with your knowledge, with your feelings, with your social instincts, even with technology and deep philosophy. But everything we saw is just a distraction. In fact, God was there all along behind every Madhanika. But I bet you did not see that. The 42 Madhanikas of Chennakesava temple have been documented extensively by both experts and visitors. But the God behind them has never been noticed or documented by anyone. Behind the beautiful, fierce hunter with the great body, there is a very calm, somber God. Carved with deep strokes and clear cuts, this God has no element of beauty, but instantly evokes some vacuum, some nothingness inside you. Here's a carving that can evoke horror and fear inside you. But behind that, there's God who can give you tranquility and eternal peace. I'm not gonna show you everything, but I hope someday you visit this temple and find out for yourself. I hope you like this video. I am Praveen Mohan. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.